lot of y'all seen this movie called The Spartans 300. Okay? I want to go through some pages here that you're going to see. You're going to find out that the Spartans and those people were Israelites. This is by Frank Miller. You got to get the one by Frank Miller. Now, a lot of y'all know about this guy right here who played the Spartans. He played a good show. It was pretty good. But now we're going to see. This book that I got here, by the way, I bought this four years before the movie 300 even came out. And I was surprised at the images that he used in here. But I never put it together until the movie came out. So some more images of uh, Leonidas right here. Let's go through this book and see how Frank Miller drew the Spartans and, and so why he drew them like this. As you see, you can see the braids right here of the Spartan warriors. You can see the L on the shield. All right? Look at this guy. Another Spartan warrior. Look, that's a black man right there. You see? Look at the guy got curly hair right there. Some had braids, some had twists, some had curly hair. Look at this right here. Look at the L. We're going to go into what this L means later on. And who was this? Let's go up here. Sacred Sparta. Okay. It was also called Laconia. Alright, so we're going to go through a couple pages in this book. Here is, remember the story about the kid, Leonidas, when he was a young kid, fighting the, 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 um, the wolf. Notice he's a black man. See, so they got him brown skin here. Right here, another picture of him as a child. This is just in the graphic novel. Of the boy. Here's some more Spartan warriors here. Get a picture of that. That's clearly a black man. Here's your Spartan brother. Look at this guy right here. That could be a West Indian, that could be a Haitian. This Spartan right here. Okay. This is out of the book 300. How come the movie wasn't done like this? Okay. Let's go through some more pictures here. All right. More black pictures. Let's skim through here. Black people, look at this. Look at this sister right here. Black folks. Clearly see their brown skin. Okay. Let's do some more brown skin pictures. Look at this right here. A picture of that. Brown skin brothers. Look at this brother. He look kind of Indian and Hispanic. These are Spartans. Not white folks. Okay, let's go through some more here. Notice you keep seeing this L pop up on the shield. We're going to go into what that means. Okay, look at this right here. Get a picture of that. That's a black man right there. They got that face. <coughs> See? Mm -hmm. Now here's, remember this king? The Persian king? Darius? Now, they, now, he was brown, he was all right, but now he's even blacker here in the, in, in, in the movie. In the movie, he, he looked like he could be an Indian or something. You know, but this, the Persians were Indian-looking people, but some of them looked like that. And it's showing you, he's showing him as a black man. You see, it was a Persian king. Here you go over here. Black man. 
And he showed you this in the, in the movie, though, that the Spartans were black people. But I'm going to show you, Frank Miller knew something. And what it is, the history shows that the Spartans were dark-skinned people. They weren't white people like they, like, like they portrayed them. Here's a boy again. Notice he's, his leg is brown. He's showing him it's brown. He's clearly showing that this, this wasn't no pale white boy how they show you in the movie. Okay? So now let's go into why Frank Miller drew these pictures as black people. And how come they're not white? He knew something. He had to make them white for the movie. But we know why that is, because it wouldn't have got out there if he did it like that. Because the common lie is that the Spartans were white people. So he had to go along with the lie. But he did slide it up in here, you know, this way for us who are seeking this knowledge. And through the Holy Bible is the book that we follow. You can't find this being in some, other, uh, some of these religions you got on the earth. I ain't going to name them, but you can't go to any religion and find out what I'm about to show you now. Okay, let me find this page. Now look, look at this right here. Listen to the Bible now. It is found in writing. This is 1 Maccabees 12, 20 and 21. Arius king of the Lacedaemonians to Onias, the high priest. Greeting. It is found in writing that the Lacedaemonians and Jews are brethren and that they are of the stock of Abraham. So now you're seeing, this is the Apocrypha, by the way. This is part of the Bible. You can find the Apocrypha was once written in the Bible when King James had it translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. They, they took it out during slavery, but this is part of the Bible. So speaking about Jonathan, the Maccabee Israelite, writing to his Lacedaemonian brothers, who are also Israelites. Now let's see who the Lacedaemonians are. This is the new annotated Oxford Bible with the Apocrypha, showing that this is how the Bible is written with the Apocrypha in it, which gives you continuing stories of Ezra in here. Continuing stories of Esther, continuing stories of Ecclesiasticus, as Ecclesiastes, the Maccabee stories, Judas, you're not going to find them in the Bible, you're going to find them in the Apocrypha, which also the word Apocrypha means hidden books. Now let's go to the same 1st Maccabees 12 and 20, and we're going to, in, in 20 and 21, and we're going to read how it's the same thing written in this in this apocrypha here, but now this is an annotated one written with other names that mean the same thing. So it says, this is a copy of the letter that they sent to Onias. Judas and Onias sent this letter to King Arius of the Spartans, to the high priest Onias. Greetings. It has been found in writing concerning the Spartans and the Jews that they are brothers and are the family of Abraham. So see how it's saying the same thing, but it's saying Lacedaemonians here. You see? It has been found in writing that the Lacedaemonians and Jews are brethren, and they have the stock of Abraham. It has been found that writing, which is the Bible, because the Spartans had the Bible, they read their re records, Concerning the Spartans and the Jews that they are brothers and are the family of Abraham. Why is that? Well, let's see what happened here. It's another book, Modern Times and Living Past by Elson. Very old book, 1941. The older the book you get, I bought this on the street too. This used to be a standard reading in Southside Junior High School Library. How come they ain't teaching this in school no more? Because the schools are about dumbing down the children now. They don't want them to learn this, this stuff. And this is on page 78. The mystical founder of Sparta was Lacedaemon, whose wife's name was Sparta. So now you're seeing here, Lacedaemon was the founder of Sparta, or the land there, and his wife's name was Sparta. So they named the land after him and his wife. You see, that's who the Spartans were, a black man and a black woman. So now, because we see the Spartans in the book were black people, we're going to go more into it. So this book tells you where this came from. All right? So we're just going through the records. You're going to put it together yourself. This is an excerpt from um, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. 
You can get a, a line on this. You can go on a computer and look up Lassa the Moon. Okay? You got that? Right. Let me just let you all just look at that. Now we're going to go to this excerpt, this guy. And, I, and this is the other books, too, but this, I got this one quick. The Spartans used the Greek letter lambda displayed on their shields as identification for their people lambda. L was used as the Spartans to represent Lacedaemon, the home state of their people. So that's why I told you to be aware of these pictures. Look at the L representing Lacedaemon, their founder and ancient leader of the Spartans, named after his wife, Sparta. You see? That's what the L represents. See the L right there? Lacedaemon, which is brothers, Spartans, brothers to the Jews, sons of Abraham. Let's go on this book, Oxford Bible Atlas, third edition, okay? Oxford, they, they're supposed to be smart people. They're supposed to be the ones that know everything. Oxford University Press. Let's go back here to this map. Get a little focus of that. This is ancient Greece. As you see, Lacedaemon, Sparta. Same thing, ancient Greece. See, it was also called Achia. Achia is the name of the ancient Greeks that fought against their arch rivals, the Trojans. Uh-oh, we're going to get a little deep. Who were the Trojans? Who were the ancient Greeks? What color should have Brad Pitt and the uh, other guy should have been in that Trojan and ancient Greek battle of, for Helen? We're going to see that later on. You be the judge. Let's get another book. This is the same book right here. I'm going to go back into the maps. I forgot to show you this right here. Same thing. This is the same book, Anatole the Bible with the Apocrypha. Map of Ancient Greece, Sparta, Lacedaemon. Right there. Same thing. Same people. The Spartans, Lacedaemon. This is a colony. Like I read earlier, Solomon had many colonies throughout Asia Minor and the Mediterranean. Sparta was one of them. Okay, let's go into the Bible and see. In Ezekiel 27, 17, and 19. See, we're going to go into ancient history and check out this whole um, thing in the Bible. Ezekiel 27, right here. 17. Judah and the land of Israel, they were merchants. They traded in the market wheat of Mineth, Panag, and honey, and oil, and balm. Jump in 19. Dan also and Javon, going to and fro, occupied in the fairs, bright iron, cassia, calamus, were in thy market. So Dan, right, one of the tribes of Israel, the fifth tribe of Israel, and Javon, right, were trading together. Javon is one of the sons of Japheth, when you read Genesis 10th chapter. So they were in Europe at this time, and Dan was trading with them because Solomon had sent a contingent of Israelites with Dan running the show, and they colonized that land. Let's see where Javon is in the records. Okay? This is going back to the record book. Javon. Where is it at? Heir of ancient Greece. Dan was coming from this land of Israel and had a colony in the land of Javon. Javon meaning one of the sons of Japheth who dwelt up in Europe. Okay?
that. Right. Let's let you all just look at that. Now we're going to go to this excerpt, this guy. And, I, and this is in other books, too, but this, I got this one quick. The Spartans used the Greek letter lambda displayed on their shields as identification for their people lambda. L was used as the Spartans to represent Lacedaemon, the home state of their people. So that's why I told you to be aware of these pictures. Look at the L, representing Lacedaemon, their founder and ancient leader of the Spartans, named after his wife, Sparta. You see? That's what the L represents. See the L right there? Lacedaemon, which is brothers, Spartans, brothers to the Jews sons of Abraham. Let's go on this book, Oxford Bible Atlas, third edition, okay? Oxford, they, they're supposed to be smart people. They're supposed to be the ones that know everything. Oxford University Press. Let's go back here to this map. Get a little focus of that. This is ancient Greece. As you see, Lacedaemon, Sparta. Same thing, ancient Greece. See, it was also called Achia. Achia is the name of the ancient Greeks that fought against the arch rivals, the Trojans. Uh-oh, we're going to get a little deep. Who were the Trojans? Who were the ancient Greeks? What color should have Brad Pitt and the uh, other guy should have been in that Trojan and ancient Greek battle for Helen? We're going to see that later on. You be the judge. Let's get another book. This is the same book right here. I'm going to go back into the maps. I forgot to show you this right here. Same thing. This is the same book, Anatole the Bible with the Apocrypha. Map of Ancient Greece. Sparta, Lacedaemon. Right there. Same thing. Same people. The Spartans, Lacedaemon. This is a colony. Like I read earlier, Solomon had many colonies throughout Asia Minor and the Mediterranean. Sparta was one of them. Okay, let's go into the Bible and see. In Ezekiel 27, 17, and 19. See, we're going to go into ancient history and check out this whole um, thing in the Bible. Ezekiel 27, right here. 17. Judah and the land of Israel, they were merchants. They traded in the market wheat of Mineth, Panag, and honey, and oil and balm. Jump in 19. Dan also and Javon, going to and fro, occupied in affairs, bright iron, cassia, calamus, were in thy market. So Dan, right, one of the tribes of Israel, the fifth tribe of Israel, and Javon. Right, we're trading together. Javon is one of the sons of Japheth when you read Genesis 10th chapter. So they were in Europe. At this time, and Dan was trading with them because Solomon had sent a contingent of Israelites with Dan running the show and they colonized that land. Let's see where Javon is in the records. Okay, this is going back to the record book. Javan, where is it at? Heir of ancient Greece. Dan was coming from this land of Israel and had a colony in the land of Javan. Javan meaning one of the sons of Japheth who dwelt up in Europe. Okay, and these were brown skinned people. The ancient people of this land were the Mysians and the Minoans. And if you uh, look at this page here, this is another book I got right here. So I'm trying to give it to you all. This is a page from a book called The Cultural Library, Volume 7, Great Events in World History by Edmund A. Brown, 1959-1960. 
By 2000 BC, a vigorous seafaring people had established themselves on Crete. There, between 2000 and 14,000, what we're reading about with the, with the um, other people was like 1200 because Israel didn't get to the, out of captivity out of Egypt until 1200 BC. So this, this is before Israel was even out of captivity. We were in captivity in Egypt during this time. These are the ancient people of Crete and a great civilization developed, centered in Cretan capital of Knossos. The Cretans built great palaces, developed a flourishing art, and constructed fleets of merchants, war vessels, ships from Crete, sailed over the East Mediterranean, right? And it speaks about the Cretan division as the Minoans. So you had the Minoans, Mysians. Now let's see, these were all the ancient people of Europe. And you would think that these must have been the first white folks, right? Let's see. From small statues and attractively painted murals, it is known that the people of Minoan, right, civilization were small, slender, and dark skinned with cur dark curly hair. The men wore their hair long but shaved their beards from their faces. So the ancient Cretans and Minoans in 2000 BC were brown skinned people. So this knocks out Japheth being white folks. People know briefly, Japheth were brown skinned people, ancient Mis Minoans and Mis Mycenaeans. Later on, they were migrated down into Indonesia and the islands of the Pacific. And they were pushed out of there by first by us, Israelites, you know, as the barbarian and Scythian tribes, as I showed you earlier, and later on by the Romans who pushed them out of there. Later on, they pushed over to the Far East as the Medes. Madiah, um, Genesis uh, 10, 1 and 2, Japheth's son Madiah became the Medes and the Persians got together. Later on, they migrated down to Indonesia, the Java Islands, Javan, and certain areas of, Mel of Melanesia in the Pacific. But getting back to the Spartans, because I just showed you this, the brown-skinned Danites were down with the brown-skinned people of Javan who were Japheth, and they we're trading together. Now check this out. This is another. This is a a, a, um, a library expert excerpt from a library brother sent to me. Bronze Spartan statue wearing a cloak and king's helmet atop braided hair, just like we saw the picture. Okay, you see that the, the plume is going from ear to ear. This would be a Spartan king. This is really how King Leonidas should have looked. Okay, check it out. Spartan. What's this L represent? Lambda L, Greek L for Lacedaemon. Okay, it's telling you. Spartan with armor spear, the L Lambda shield and royal helmet. And they showed the movie how the brothers were like naked fighting. They were dressed in armor. It shows you how they were dressed. And look at this, another Spartan. Spartan bronze figure, 500 BC, totally armored, and went running around with underwear and capes. You see, fifth century BC, heavily armored, hoplite soldier in marble. Now check this, check this picture out right here. This is this is a picture of a Spartan warrior. Now this is another excerpt I got from a diction, from um, a uh, computer layout. Get this computer um, ID right here. Sparta, Art of Sparta. Now I got some of the pictures that I just showed you. Same pictures as you see. Now th what does this say? A bronze statue of a Spartan wearing a cloak around 500 BC. Same picture, they're totally gone, armored. Spartan hoplite, there's a Lacedaemonian L. But check this one out. Same as this picture right here, right? 5th century BC hoplite or heavily armored soldier, possibly the Spartan king Leonidas, a Durian who died holding the pass at the Battle of Thermopylae. So he was a Durian. Let's go into the Durians. See, we're breaking it down and showing you about these kings and who they really were. This is from a book called Our Descent from Israel Proved. Okay, and, and the brother gave me this excerpt, 
He didn't give me the name of the, of the author, but it's page 48. If you find this book, get it for me, because I'd like to have more than just this excerpt. Okay, now it says this. This proves who were the Dorians. Colonel Gaius says it is worthy of note that Danis, who is recorded as landing in Greece from Egypt, was said to be the son of Bella, sometimes spelt Bella, was strongly resembled Bilha, the name of Jacob's concubine, the mother of Dan. And it said, I'm going to go to the point. These Dorians of Greece crossed from Asia Minor, Western Asia, into ancient Alpia, Mysia, and Sparta. These Dorians were Danites, right? And the men of Judah, of the line of Darda. Darda was an Israelite, uh, this, uh, descendant of um, Dan, or they were also called Dardanians. So it tells you, hence, the wonderful Doric structures of Europe came largely from the skilled minds of the master masons and mechanics of the Danites. See Second Chronicles. That's, um, you can read that. Maybe you can find Greek or Latin and find out what that is, but it's 13, 14 verse. Professor E. Odium, National Message and Banner. W. E. Gladstone in his Juvis Mundi tells us that the name Danai is used in the Iliad 147 times and he connects the Danai of Greece with the Tutha de Danon of Northern Ireland and this confirmed by Irish traditions. Mm -hmm. So we're showing you how the Dorians came in, conquered the Mysians, took them out, and they set themselves up and they became known as the Spartans. Their leader was most likely Lazidamon. But they were called that they were called Dorians because you see Leonidas were called a Dorian. Now here, another map. This is this is this is from the back of this red Bible, Watchtower Red Bible. In the back it has Javon. So this is another record showing you Devon is Greece. You got that? Get mm -hmm. it in the light here. Alright. So now this is from another book called the Heritage of the Anglo-Saxon Race by M. H. Gaia. This is history that they don't tell you about in the Bible. The Bible is linked up with the history of Egypt and many different lands. It says by 1296 B.C., Dan had a large shipping trade and started conquering and colonizing territory outside Palestine. The book of Joshua, 47 chapter, 19 chapter, 47 verse. The inheritance that fell to this tribe from Ashkelon to Joppa was far too small to satisfy these men of turbulent, adventurous spirit. With a short time, therefore, 600 of them, with their families, marched off towards and conquered Leishim and Laish, right? Following their tribal custom, renamed respectively Dan and Manhan Dan, and after the name of Dan, their father. I'm going to jump to the point. The Dan colonists of Laish, Israelites, became the Danites of the north, known to names of Dan, Dardan, and the Danes. Mm -hmm. So it shows you these names, Israelites, that went up in there and became the Dardanians. We just read Darda coming out of that history. The great Danes of Europe, the Danish. The rest of the tribe renamed south, the south remained south, because Dan broke into two groups. One group went over here to Javan, what we read in the Bible. One group stayed in Israel, right, and later went up north and became known as Dan and Danon. Then it says the northern tribes, later on, did not long remain content with their new territory, right? They later on, now this is the same guy in the other one, W.E. Gladstone says the siege of Troy was undertaken by the Danai or Dan settlers in Greece. Siege of Troy. So the Achaeans, Greeks, and the Trojan Wars were what? Danite settlers in Greece against the Dardanii, and that these two peoples were originally one. So these were two Danite families fighting each other right here. The Trojans and the ancient Greeks were two Danites fighting, fighting each other. This was back in like the 1200s. Later on, their, their descendants became the Spartans. That's what I'm showing you. This large from the plains of Troy by the Danai forces of Greece, the Dardanians went to Byzantium. So I'm just showing you the history of how Dan became uh, the ancestors of the Trojans, of the, of the ancient Greeks who fought them, Helen, Achilles. Now let's go. I'm talking now. Let's go into 
the record. Homer, the Iliad. We just mentioned, Danai is mentioned 147 times in the Iliad. Let's go in the Iliad in the glossary and look that up. Actually, when to look up this name right here, I'm, I'm going to link it all back. Okay. Lacedaemon is in the Iliad. City, kingdom of Menelaus in the southern Peninsulas. Let's look up the word Menelaus. So Lacedaemon is in the Trojan stories of the Iliad. Lacedaemon, as we know, is an ancient name of, or name also of Sparta, which was the leader of the Dorians that came and conquered Greece from the Japhet um, Mysians and the, and the uh, Javan, who have Japhet. Let's go look at Menelaus. Okay. Menelaus. Achean. We just read the, the nation name of, of Greece. Was, one of the names of Greece was called Achia. Son of Atreus, king of Lacedaemon, brother of Agamemnon, husband of Helen. So here, Helen of Troy, Agamemnon were all Lacedaemonians coming out of that line. Okay? So now we're going over here to look up this word. Let's go to the Achaeans. The Achaeans, Greeks and their allies against Troy. So now let's look up the Trojans. All in the same book. Who the Trojans? People of Troy, the allies of Troy arrayed against the Achaeans. Tros, ancestral king of Troy, son of Ethronimus, father of Ilus. So Ilus goes back to this brother who they named the Iliad after. Troy comes from Tros, an ancient ancestral king of Troy who founded that land. And he was an Israelite, a Danite, because they were both Danite families. Achaeans and Trojans were the same people, Dan, fighting each other. Southern Danites, northern Danites. Troy, capital of Trod, city of Tros, and the Trojans, alternately named called Ilium, or Iliad, or Ilus. And this was an ancient um, um, brother, Etronius, who came out of the line of, of Tros. So it was Tros, named Troy. Troy came out of, you know, Lacedaemon. He had a son called Etroph, um, Erich Thonius. Let's look up Erich Thonius. Kind of hard to mention, you can pronounce it, but we're going to look it up. These are, this is black history you're learning here. Okay? Let's look this up. Ethonius. Okay. Should have had it marked, but they gotta find it. How do we spell that? E R. Should be over here. Here we go. E Rich Thonius. Right? This is in the Trojan stories of the Iliad. Son of Dardanus, father of Tros, forebearer of the kings of Troy. Remember those names. Dardanus. Tros, Troy, look up Dardanus. Let's go into it. Okay? Dardanus, right? Son of Zeus, father of Etronius, forever of the Priam and the kings of Troy. Priam was the father of Hector, who fought Achilles. He was a Dard Dardanus. Now, Dardanians, people descended from Dardanus. Dardanus. Okay? So they were called Dardanians. Now you have, we just read in, in the history here about Dan coming out of, no, here we go, right here. About, look at this. These Dorians were Danites and men of Judah of the line of Darda. See? Or Danans of Argos, the Danans, the Danai, okay?
Alexander the Great of Greece had to conquer the East to rid the planet of Nephilim. As we had researched in our first videos concerning the Greeks spreading into Europe, we know that the Greeks of Argos, who were in fact Hebrews, the Spartans were Hebrews of the tribe of Dan and others, had spread all along Europe, all the way to Ireland and Scotland and Scandinavia. Now, the fact that uh, the Archangel Gabriel gave a prophecy to the prophet Daniel of the Old Testament, this was about 700 BC, concerning the coming of a little horn from the east that would conquer the king of Persia, this little horn was Alexander the Great, in fact. The Archangel Gabriel also told the prophet Daniel that he would only live 33 years and that his kingdom would be split not to his uh, heirs, his children, but into four divisions to his generals, which is exactly what happened. So he did not go to the West that was already uh, uh, colonized by the ancient Greeks. He went to the East to get rid of the Nephilim. As many important leaders, he also took historians with him that would keep journals of his battles and his trips uh, and uh, his decisions of what he would be doing politically in the areas that he conquered. And all these have been handed down through the ages. One of the saints we'll see later on in this video makes mention of one of these journals and the, the disgusting uh, races of mixed humans and animals and demonic beings, the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, whatever you want to call them, uh, they were not human, they were something else, but they were uh, menace to the human race because they were uh, man-eating beings. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that Alexander the Great had to go to the East. He killed most of them. Others he threw down pits and he built pyramids over them, whereas the opening of the pits were sealed with various metals that these beings could not touch, otherwise they would be, uh, these metals were toxic to these beings. So you'll hear this in detail. We have to mention that Alexander the Great believed in one God, the creator of all. He first went to the temple of Jerusalem where he was told the prophecy by the high priests of the temple, a prophecy to uh, of Archangel Gabriel to Daniel. And he then went to Egypt where he was made a pharaoh. He asked the priests there, am I a god? And they said, yes, you are the son of a god. Maybe it's because they knew he was the biological son of the last proper pharaoh of Egypt who ran off in exile to Thessalonica to be with his mother. That was Pharaoh Nectanebo. In Daniel 8 of the Old Testament, we have a prophecy given to the prophet Daniel, who was uh, with the exiles in Babylon about 500 or so BC. He was given a vision by the Archangel Gabriel concerning the vision of the ram and the he-goat. The little he-goat with, with the one horn coming from the west was uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, this prophecy, this vision, stated that he would only live to 33 years old, that he would quickly conquer the known world, put an end to the uh, ram with the two horns, that is the king of Persia, who had stretched his kingdom from the, you know, his empire from the east to the west. 
he would only live to 33 years of age. His heirs would not inherit his kingdom. And this we see because of the fact that one of his top generals, Cassander, did in fact murder his wife, Roxani, and his son, heir to the throne, Alexander IV. And that his kingdom would be divided in four parts amongst his generals, which in fact did take place. So we see that all this was in fact predetermined by God. The one good thing that happened because of the spreading of the empire, uh, of the Greek empire of Alexander the Great is the fact that he unified the language of that known world to being Greek concerning the reptilians and various uh, races that live in the chambers of the earth underground. Uh, they're called the dirty and uh, contemptible races of beings. Uh, I'll read it in Greek first and then I'll translate it for you. Togar etos ekino that year apophraxi kyrios o theos the Lord God will unlock tas pilas tas in via, the gates that are in India, uh, as eklisen Alexandros oton Macedonon, which Alexander uh, the Macedon, that is Alexander the Great, had closed up, ke exelepsunte vasili, vasilis evdomikonta dio, and uh, out will come 72 kings of those races. Ama to lao afton, from those people. Talegomena ripara ethni, that is, those dirty nations that are called dirty, which means um, dirty in the sight of God and of men. Tavdeliromata, tavdelirotata pasas, sikasias ke disodias the dirtiest of all of the detestable and filthy. And they will um, go into all of the earth worldwide. Uh, which is under heaven. Sarkas anthropon zosas estiondas. They will eat the flesh of living human beings geta do ema piondas and they will drink their blood so uh, to say to translate it again in english uh, in that year or in that time the lord god will unlock the gates or the chambers or the tombs or the underground vaults that are in india which Alexander the Macedon, Alexander the Great, um, had locked up, and they will, uh, and out will come the seventy-two kings of those races, of those races which are called the dirty, filthy, abominable nations, um, which are the dirtiest and the most abominable and the filthiest. And they will spread out throughout the world worldwide over the whole of the earth under the heavens, eating the flesh of living human beings and drinking their blood. One of the acts of Alexander the Great, which was uh, very important, significant for mankind, and not touched upon, not learned by most people in the West, is the fact that through his travels into Asia, from Greece, through Turkey, through Babylon, through India, all the way to the people who were producing silk for material, that is China, he came across monsters 
what we would call today reptilian type of um, beings um, of various kinds everything from mermaids to flesh eating monsters to giants anywhere between 6 to 11 12 meters tall monsters with six hands and six feet dog-faced people dog-headed people the invisible demons of the forest which would uh, come out and scream and speak at night hairy men a type of human beings that had hair all over their bodies which we would call today something like the abominable snowman or the yeti he came across them very often the men who had the appearance of women that is men without facial hair which are um, of course the American Indians uh, regularly don't have facial hair and of course centaurs you know the half men half uh, half men half horse Um, and let's not forget from antiquity, from the time of the Exodus of Moses and uh, Joshua, when the Israelites entered into the Holy Land, they had to, they had the commandment from God to kill various uh, peoples in that land, in, the, in, in those cities. And most of these people were giants. Um, when Moses sent in his 12 spies to spy on the land that God promised them, they all came back frightened with reports that they were huge. There was no way on earth or heaven that they could fight and win against these giants. The only two men that were not afraid but put all their trust in God were Caleb and Joshua. And these were the only two men of the first of the exodus of the Israelis who, of Israel, 40 years later, who did reach the Holy Land because of their, their faith. They never wavered. So uh, the big cities that were given as cities of refuge were all um, basically the strongholds and the big cities of the Ammonites or the uh, Rephaim. Um, sorry, the um, Anakim. Uh, and one of these, of course, was uh, where we get the story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath was six, ha six fingered and six toed. And he had um, a huge stance, he was a giant, and so were his brothers. So these are the types of people that monsters, beasts that um, Alexander the Great had to deal with, fight against, and he decided that he had to lock them up.
the rabbis were in Medina and the Quraysh sent a delegation to find out from them how can we tell whether this man Nabi Muhammad is indeed a prophet. The rabbis had asked him three questions which only a prophet can answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending the answers to the three questions. One of the questions was ask him about the great traveler ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the world. So with question one, ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the earth. And we are told that this traveler is called Zulkarnain, the one who possesses two Karn. And Karn can mean a horn, so Karnain will be two horns. Kulsadu Aiku Minhu Zikra. I am going to tell you something about him which must be remembered. Inna makkanna lahu fil abdi wa atainahu min kulli shayin sabara. Behold, we established him on earth securely with the power, with the means, with the capacity and the knowledge and the right means to achieve anything that he might set out to achieve. And so surely a superpower, not an ordinary power, a superpower. Fred Ba'a Sababa. And so he chose the right means now to do what he wanted to do. He sets out on a journey to the west. And uh, he reaches a place where the sun is setting. And there he found it setting in a body of water that was Hamia, dark, murky. So visibility in that water will be very shallow. Is it possible for us to identify that body of water? If we can, we'll be on the way to locating the geographical location of the area in which we're talking about. We're going to do that in a moment, inshallah. Then Zulkarnain set off on the second journey now. And he's going to the rising of the sun. And so now he travels in the third direction. He comes to a place between two, a path between two mountain ranges. On this side are mountains, on this side are mountains. And in between there is a pass. Can we locate Geographically, where are we talking about? Is it possible? A pass between two mountain ranges. And there he came across, he came across a people, He came across a people whose language he could not understand. Because their language was unique. Their language had no connections with other language in that region. It was a language which was not connected with all the other languages in that region. It was a unique language. When they had learned to communicate with each other, then these people spoke to Zulkarnain and said to him, Ya Zulkarnain, O Zulkarnain, Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja musiduna fil-ab. 
Gog and Magog are committing acts of facade in our territory. O oh, Zulkarnain, can you help us? You have the power. Can you build a barrier to protect us from these people? He should have said, I don't need to build any barrier. I'll move in there and I'll beat them up. And they won't touch you anymore. So I don't need to build any barrier. I'll go and teach them a lesson they'll never forget. But no, he didn't say that. They said, we prepared to pay you. He said, I don't need your money. What Allah has given to me is more valuable. He recognized that even though he had this power, his power was not enough to be able to go and teach them a lesson. So he agreed to build a barrier, recognizing that their power was so great that even he could not defeat them. What I need from you is your labor. Help me with your manpower. And I'm going to build a barrier between you. Now number 96, verse number 96. Bring me blocks of iron. And so that has to be a geographical location where there's iron ore. It has to be a geographical location where there are mountain ranges and a pass between the mountain ranges. It has to be a geographical location where on the left you have a body of water which is so dark and murky that visibility is very shallow. Okay? And it has to be an area where there are large deposits of iron ore. Bring me blocks of iron. And after he had covered the pass with blocks of iron, he said, build a furnace, blow with your bellows. And now bring me molten copper. So he poured the molten copper and the engineers, we have an engineer here, tells me that this is to prevent rust. And after he had built the barrier and covered it, the Quran speaks, it changes from the word Sabdain to use another word, Sadafain. In verse number 95, أَعْتُونِ زُبَرَ الْحَدِيدِ حَتَّى إِذَا سَاوَ بَيْنَ السَّدَفَيْنِ Previously the word used was Saddain but now the word used is Saddafain Saddain is two barriers two mountain ranges but Saddafain is something else it is like the two sides of a shell we're going to have some pictures of this now the two sides of a shell, you've been to the seashore. When you open a shell like this, it will join at the bottom, but open at the top. That's the shape of the path between the mountains. Join at the bottom, open at the top. Hmm? So when he had blocked off this space, this sadafail, now the molten copper is put on it. Gog and Magog could neither scale the barrier nor could they penetrate it so they are now trapped behind the barrier and so Zulkarni now says this barrier is constructed in, in, in consequence of Allah's kindness and grace for but when that time come of which my ward has worn is a futihat they will not return to reclaim the town as their, as their own until either Futihad, until Gog and Magog are released. When that time comes for Gog and Magog to be released so that Banu Israel are to be brought back to the Holy Land, Nabikum Lafifa, brought back as a motley crowd, at that time, Allah is going to bring down this barrier and it become dust. Now let's turn to the pictures and see whether we can locate. This is the Caucasus Mountains here. The white being the snow. And on the left side there is a body of water. 
which is so dark and so murky with so much algae in it that it has been given a name and that name has been there with it for many 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 years even the time of Ibn Kathir it's called the Black Sea it's called the Black Sea why? because it is so dark if you go to the Mediterranean Sea and you're on a ship you can see several meters underneath the water but if you go to the Black Sea you'll hardly be able to see more than one meter underneath the water Ibn Kathir recognizes this to be the sea mentioned in the Quran as Hania on this side of the Black Sea is the Caspian Sea and in between the Caspian and the Black Sea is this body of land. So we see that Zulkarnain is traveling in that direction to the west and then in this direction to the east. The Caucasus Mountains are an unbroken range of mountains from that end to this end but in between the Caucasus mountains there is one pass only one in between it's called the Dariel Gorge there we are there is the gorge and there is one side and there is the other side and it's like an open shell see the Quran is describing this Sadafain. So we have, I believe, established for you the geographical location of God and Magad. The people who are located behind the barrier. Behind the barrier, on that side of the Caucasus were the Khaza, a tribe of people who converted and became Jews. Must have been on a Sunday morning. And some of them converted from Judaism and became Christians. Must have been on a Sunday evening. So you have Khaza, you have Khaza who are Jews, and you have Khaza who are Christians. But they did not become Jews because of religious conviction. They became Jews as a matter of political convenience. So they don't particularly care for Torah and for the laws of diet and so on. So these are people who are Jews as a nation, but not as a religion. <laughs> huh? A nation, not a religion. These are the people who today control power in the world. It is the Zionist movement, it is the Anglo-American Alliance, which is now a Zionist Alliance. It is Gog and Magar. They are the ones who control power in the world and they are delivering to Israel the status of ruling state in the world. And in Sahih Muslim Allah said the Hadith Al-Qudsi about Gog and Magar which explains why Zulkarnain agreed to build the barrier. I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. Gog and Magog, of course, are human beings, not some strange creatures with airs from here to San Fernando. And 
tall from here to the clouds, they are human beings. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, they are Banu Adam. Banu Adam, human beings. When Gog and Magog are released into the world, there are many, if you'll allow me to use this word, there are many footprints by which we would be able to recognize them when they're released into the world. But before we go to looking for the footprints, let us go to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. Nabi Muhammad was asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he woke up from his sleep when the hadith is located in Sahih Bukhari in several different versions from several different sources companions. So we say it is mutawatir. He woke up from his sleep what he had seen in his sleep, also a vision like Ibrahim alayhi salam, was so terrible, so terrible, that his face was red, flushed, red. It has to be something terrible for the Prophet of Allah to wake up with his face all red, flushed, red. What did he see? He woke up and he spoke these memorable lines. He said, Wailul lil Arab, min sharrin qadik taraba. Woe unto the Arabs, because of an evil, shab, an evil. It can't be an ordinary evil for his face to be so flushed red. It has to be a very great evil, which is now close. And then he raised his hands like this and he said, Today, <coughs> today means this day or 1000 years from now. Where has reason fled? He said, Today, a hole has been made in the rudder. He didn't use the word sad, he used the word rudder. Surah Al-Kaf has both the words. When they ask Zulkarnain to build it, they use the word sad. When he built it, he used the word rudder. And the hadith says the rudder of Zulkarnain, of Yajuj and Majuj. Today a hole has been made, indicating that the great evil which is going to devastate the Arabs has not as yet occurred. It is an end time event because the words Gog and Magog are there. What is this great catastrophe that is coming on the Arabs? What is this great destruction that is coming on the Arabs which has not as yet come? Where? is Islamic scholarship today. Why are you not asking these questions? And I'm not asking the Malay ulama. I'm not asking the Indonesian ulama. I'm asking the Arab ulama. She asked, Who? Zainab. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. Anuhlika. Will we be destroyed? Anuhlika, halaka, to destroy. Huh? Will we be destroyed? This is the word she asked. Will we, the Arabs, be destroyed when there are righteous people amongst us? The hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. He said, Naam, yes. And then he went on to use words I never understood until recently. Until I saw the pathetic state of Islamic scholarship today. And the even pathetic state of those who lead Muslims today. 
He said, either Cathur al when the scum prevails, then it will come. And today, the scum prevails. They have eyes and yet they cannot see. They have ears and yet they cannot hear. They have hearts and yet they do not understand. They're worse than cattle. They're the scum. And when the scum prevails, then the destruction of the Arabs, not the Malay, not the Turks, the Arabs will take place. Indicating that in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, not only did was Dajjal released, but also the Dargan Magad was released. The barrier was brought down in the lifetime of the Prophet. All praises to the Most High, the Creator of Creators, the Framer and the Shaper of all. Hey, hey, love and light to my loved ones, the copper colored faces, my melanations, and to the seekers of truth from other persuasions. This presentation will examine and explore the history of the people whose ancestors stated were the youngest of all nations. This history is recorded is beginning in the regions of Hyperborea. And into the regions of Scabia. Asia. As we get into the documented records and historical accounts, 
we will see who inhabited the Hyperborean regions into Scabia, and then how and when the regions of Europe and Asia were invaded, conquered, assimilated, and the original people replaced. This history of conquests and usurps will show how it was much like the events depicted in the TV series Game of Thrones. However, with the exception of and without the actual or more historically correct depictions of the people in the kingdoms that were being attacked and usurped. Although the TV series is based on a fictional novel, it does depict some similarity in actual conquests of Europe, Asia, and Persia. The fictional TV series primarily takes place in the make-believe lands of Westeros and Essos, which looks very similar to the ancient landscape of Western Europe. From the Isles of Albion, to the lands beneath the Nord or North Sea. However, very typical of many such productions, what is conveniently left out is a very significant and influential group of people in European history who were called Moors. History tells us that the Moors ruled southern Europe and the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and Portugal for over 700 years. It is important to note that many of these original Moors were defined as Arabic or Saracens that migrated into North Africa and mixed with the Barbers dwelling in Barbary and Tunisia.
In Tunisia, which is originally the Roman province of Africa and the original location of Africa before it became known for the continent namesake. And this is the region now corresponding to northern Algeria and Morocco today. Now it is also important to acknowledge and to recognize that often grouped with the Moors, M-O-O-R Moors, are the Moors, M-O-H-R Moors, or several groups of archaic people who live in the fen of the wet marshlands of Northern Europe. The term Moor, M-O-H-R, which in German and Dutch is also a term for a person of swarthy or dark complexion. This is the melanated blue blood nobility of Northern Europe, who are depicted in many paintings and statues in Constantinople, Russia, and Germany all throughout the Byzantine era from 330 AD to just a few centuries ago in 1453. However, now often grouped under the same title as the 14th century term Moor, M-O-O-R, the pre-existing presence of the swarthy Moors, M-O-H-R, of the Finns in the regions of Northern Europe is confirmed by the excavations of many archaic so-called Negro skeletons or skeletal remains found, some dated over 40,000 years old. This proves pre-existence and it also tells us who the ancient people populating Europe were eons before the Moors, the M-O-O-R Moors of Southern Europe, prevailed from 711 A.D. to 1492 A.D. and before the 7th century B.C.E. or before the Common or Christian Era, which is a very important period in the timeline of the history of Europe and the course of events to follow. As we review the documented and recorded historical accounts, we begin to see the barbarian invasions of Europe and Asia and a real life claim of thrones beginning around the seventh century BCE or before the common or Christian era.
Now, before I go on, let me state that this presentation is a study based on documented and recorded historical accounts and scientific confirmations from anthropology and genealogy, and it is in no way meant to offend anyone. I actually had a discussion with a friend of mine who I've known for almost 30 years, who happens to be a descendant of German and Irish immigrants, who are just known today as Americans. We discussed, among other things, the TV series Game of Thrones and how just about every movie or TV series that is made primarily depicts white people or Caucasians as every main character and race in ancient history. My friend stated that it was like a total whitewashing of history, as if people of color didn't exist or were a rarity on earth. When I responded with, this misconception and propaganda is rooted in a history of systematic usurps and replacement, my friend of German and Irish ancestry was intrigued and wanted to know more and especially how. So to have a better perspective of this history of the people who began entering into Europe around the 7th century before the common or Christian era, let's first familiarize ourselves with a few of the words and terms that define the people and the lands and regions that they inhabited according to archaeology, anthropology, and historical accounts. Hyperborea is recorded by the Greeks to be far north of Thrace, and in modern times it would be considered to be located within the Arctic Circle. To get a better idea of location, here is a map of Thrace and the neighboring countries. The Greeks also recorded that the Hyperboreans were a race of giants who lived beyond the north wind. This race of giants, or Nephilim, as discussed earlier, inhabited the furthest regions of the Nord or North. When we look at the etymology of the word North, we see what I've said before that many words that are translated into the English language are the opposite from their original meanings. Case in point, the word North or Nord. According to etymology, the word north or nord may be ultimately from pi or the Proto-Indo-European nerve, which means left or also below. And sources also of the sacred Naraka, hell, Greek Neratos, deeper, lower, down, and earthen, from beneath. The original meaning of the word North or Nord may also explain why the world maps are upside down and why we are taught and told to believe that they are right side up. Barbarian is a term that applies to whatever pertains to life of uncivilized people. In ancient times, this term was applied by the Greeks and the Romans to the uncivilized people of the North or Nord. The Scythian tribes of the Siberian plains and the Xantrochroids inhabiting the regions of the Caucasus Mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Usurp or usurpation means taking someone's power or property by force. It is defined as wrongful or illegal encroachment, infringement, or seizure. However, every land that has been colonized has been usurped, and this usurpation perpetuates today as they continue to seize and hold. When we look at the earliest records of the people from the Nord, 
we see several historical accounts on the particular group of people called the Scavians, who were also called the Scape, Saka, and the Sake. The Scavians were a group of tribes of nomadic warriors who originally lived in what is now southern parts of Siberia. Their culture flourished from around 900 BCE to around 200 BCE, by which time they had conquered and extended their influence all over Central Asia, from China to the Northern Black Sea and all the regions around. There are several historical writings describing the physical appearance of the Scabians. According to genealogy, geneticist Christian Kaiser of the University of Strasbourg in France provided Y chromosome DNA in 2009 for the study of the haplotypes and haplogroups of 26 human specimens from the Krasnoyarsk area in Siberia, dated from between the middle of the 2nd millennium BCE and the 4th century AD. Nearly all subjects belong to the haplogroups RM17, the Y chromosome DNA haplogroup which is distributed in large regions in Eurasia, extending from Scandinavia and Central Europe to Southern Siberia and South Asia. This data shows that between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, the populations known as Scathians were blue or green-eyed, fair-skinned, and light-haired people. As we look back in time from this current era to before the common or Christian era in the 4th century AD, Bishop Gregory of Nasa wrote that the Scathians were fair-skinned and blonde-haired. The 4th century AD Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus wrote that the Alans, a people closely related to the Scabians, were tall, blonde, and light-eyed. In the 2nd century or early 3rd century AD, the Greek physician Galen declared that Sarmatians, Scabians, and other northern peoples have reddish hair. The second century AD Greek philosopher Polemon includes the Scathians among the northern peoples characterized by red hair and blue or gray eyes. In his book Natural History, the first century AD Roman author Pliny the Elder characterizes the series. sometimes identified as Scathians or Tocharians as red-haired and blue-eyed. In the 2nd century BCE or before the common or Christian era, Han Chinese envoy Zhang Qian described the Scathians as having yellow hair and blue eyes. In the 2nd century BCE or before the common or Christian era, Han Chinese envoy 
Zhang Qian described the Scythians as having yellow hair and blue eyes. This would describe the Golden Horde. The irony of all this recorded accounts today is that the people who made them are now depicted as the people who they were describing. In the 5th century before the common or Christian era, a Greek historian by the name of Herodotus wrote extensively about the lifestyle, customs, and traditions of the people from the Nord. Herodotus was an ancient Greek historian who was born in Halicarnassus and the Persian Empire, modern day Bodrum, Turkey. He lived from around 484 before the coming of Christian era to 425 before the coming of Christian era. And he is known for having written the book, The Histories, considered the founding work of history in Western literature. Like the other Greeks of his time, Herodotus was swarthy in complexion, and he wrote about the customs of pale-skinned Scythians, who he referred to as barbarians.
or rather to describe the Budini of Scabia as red haired and gray eyed. So the question now becomes, how did the historians and philosophers who describe these physical features of the Scabians become depicted with the same physical features of the nomadic Scabians today? Let's have a quick exercise in critical thinking and common sense. If you were living in the known civilized world and you began to see people that you have never seen before invading and migrating into your land, people with physical features unlike yours or anyone that you knew, how would you describe them? Would you point out the differences in these strangers that you see in contrast to the people that you have known all of your existence? Will people with pale skin, blonde or red hair, gray, green or blue eyes make a point to mention, physically describe and to distinguish another group of people spreading into their land if they look exactly like them? Or is this something that someone would say who had never encountered people with a different skin color? hair, or eye color. In his book, Histories, Herodotus gives us a timeline of when the nomadic barbarian Scythians began invading Europe in the fifth century before the coming of Christian era. Herodotus, as well as many other historians, state that the Scabians had no written language. So, my question is, how and where do they get that these people are remotely responsible for so-called Indo-European languages or the written languages of Europe that pre-existed and preceded them? I mean, if you have no written language, you have no alphabet. So these people came into Europe with no written language, no alphabet. Another bold-faced lie is that the barbarian Scathian tribes built the original castles, palaces, and kingdoms of Europe. The truth is, these barbarians didn't build the original castles or kingdoms throughout Europe. Where is the evidence of pre-existing castles, palaces, kingdoms in Siberia, or the steps of the Caucasus, or in the mountains, or in the caves, for that matter? Where is this evidence? Where is the evidence of pre-existing castles, palaces, and kingdoms in Siberia? or the steps of the caucus, or the caves, or in the lands in the north or north where the barbaric Scathian tribes inhabited that predate the many castles, palaces, and kingdoms throughout Europe. Where they at? In this History Illustrated video, we're going to talk about the vocabulary word nomad. Now, typically when we use this word, we're talking about a group of nomadic people. So I'm going to write nomadic people here. And what that basically means is they have no permanent home. 
So no permanent home, which means they're constantly wandering around with their livestock and cattle looking for fresh grass and water and things like that to feed their animals and to take care of themselves. So typically we would call them like a wanderer. So I'm going to put wanderer here or a traveler. And these groups of people would be known as nomadic people or simply one of them would be called a nomad. So you see, it's common sense. Interesting to note, the first written use of the word or name Slavs dates to the 6th century AD when the Slavic tribes inhabited a large portion of Central and Eastern Europe. During the 6th century AD, nomadic Scythians, Sarmatians, Alans, and other tribes living on the Eurasian steppes have been absorbed by the region's Slavic population. The word slave derives from the Slavs of Central and Eastern Europe, who were taken into servitude by the Muslims of Spain during the 9th century AD. Therefore, I submit that the term slave was derived from the word Slavs, originally did not and does not apply to the copper color races found here in the Americas. By the reign of Pope Zachary from 741 to 752, Venice had established a thriving slave trade, buying in Italy, among other places, and selling to the Moors in northern Africa. When the sale of Christian slaves to Muslims was banned, Pactum Lothori, the Venetians began to sell Slavs, or slaves, and other Eastern European non-Christian slaves in greater numbers. Caravans of slaves traveled from Eastern Europe through Alpine, Passes, and Austria to reach Venice. 
Southern Italy boasted slaves from distant regions, including Greece, Bulgaria, Armenia, and Slavic regions. During the 9th and 10th centuries, Amalfi was a major exporter of slaves to North Africa. Genoa, along with Venice, Italy, dominated the trade in Eastern Mediterranean beginning in the 12th century and in the Black Sea beginning in the 13th century. They sold both Baltic and Slavic slaves as well as Armenians, Caucasians, and Georgians, Turks, and other ethnic groups of the Black Sea and the Caucasus. These Italians sold these Slavic people to the Muslim nations of the Middle East, and Genoa, Italy primarily managed the slave trade from Crimea to Mamluk, Egypt, until the 13th century. The major European languages, including English, use variations of the word slave in reference to Slavic laborers of Byzantium, an ancient Greek colony and early antiquity that later became Constantinople. Istanbul Although known as the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantium, the Greek term Byzantium continued to be used as a name for Constantinople during the Byzantine Empire in reference to the capital of the empire. Byzantium was colonized by the Greeks from Megara in 657 before the Christian era and remained primary Greek speaking until its fall in 1453 AD. 